Astronauts Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders were awakened in their crew quarters this morning at 2.36 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. They went down the hall from the crew quarters here at the Kennedy Space Center and uh, took a physical examination, a brief launch day examination, and were declared physically fit by the three examining physicians, Drs. Alan Harder, Dr. Jerry Joyner, and Dr. Jack Teagan. The astronauts then sat down to breakfast. They had a menu of filet mignon, scrambled eggs, toast, coffee, and tea. Guests at the breakfast included George Lowe, director, Apollo program director at the Manned Spacecraft Center, Donald K. Slayton, who's director of flight crew operations at the Manned Spacecraft Center, two of the backup pilots for the Apollo 8 mission, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, astronaut Jack Schmidt also attended the breakfast. Uh, following the breakfast, the astronauts uh, went to the suit room where they donned their spacesuits. The crew departed from the crew quarters at 4.32 a.m. this morning and began and to... Jack King is reviewing for you the detail that we gave you earlier of the astronauts' uh, early morning activity. There is great excitement, of course, here at Cocoa Beach, Cape Kennedy, and Merritt Island, where this uh, moon port is there 1,200 newsmen, uh, including representatives from 22 nations, are here. There are diplomats, ambassadors, and charges d'affaires from 69 nations present. Two of the Supreme Court justices, Brennan and Stewart, are here, and two cabinet members, uh, Labor's Wirtz and Agriculture's Freeman, the heads of the Atomic Energy and the Civil Service and the Federal Communications Commission, among 3,000 VIPs who were invited for this uh, launch, and. Uh, to my mind, the most uh, V of all the VIPs, uh, Charles Lindbergh, is here, who in 1927, 41 years ago, made that first solo flight across the Atlantic in an airplane with 232 horsepower compared to that 130 million horsepower of this thing sitting out there on pad 39A. We got a report uh, from the uh, crew quarters Apollo 8 crew quarters uh, yesterday evening that the men were exceedingly calm and that some people who had seen a lot of these flights had never seen such calm prevailing. And yet, uh, last night, the acting head of the space program, uh, Dr. Payne, told me that, uh, uh, that everybody here at Cape Kennedy knows how much is riding on this one, not only in the safety of the uh, mission itself, but in the whole future of the space program and in America's prestige in the space race. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 8 will continue in a moment. Now the count is T minus 18 minutes and counting toward the launch of Apollo 8 at 7.51 a.m. Here's what this mission is all about. It's the toughest we've ever attempted, of course. This is man's attempt to get to the moon. Now the moon is moving around the Earth, as you know, and the Earth and the moon both are moving around the sun. Uh, as a consequence, because the moon is moving around the Earth at some 230 miles distance, roughly, it varies a little bit, but at that distance, uh, and taking off two and a half days before landing there, obviously this flight has to be programmed to sort of lead the moon, like a duck shooter leading a duck. Uh, we've got to aim a little bit ahead of it and try to be there at the same time the moon gets there. And here's how the mission will be flown. This is the Earth. It's 224,890,000 miles circumference against the moon's 2,790-mile circumference, uh, and this moon 230,000 miles away. The launch takes place from the Cape here, goes into orbit, Earth orbit, makes two loops as around the Earth, as the spacecraft systems are being checked out by the pilots. When they decide they're going to commit to lunar uh, flight, they will fire off uh, their third stage engine, the 200,000 pounds of it here, and that will take them out into what's called the translunar trajectory. They will drop that third stage and then be on their own for the two and a half day flight to the moon. They get to the moon and out there they approach at uh, 70 miles high, they fire their uh, service propulsion system engine uh, here at this point 20,500 pounds thrust it has and that puts them first time into a circular orbit 70 miles high. They will continue that orbit uh, for uh, some 10 
uh, revolutions, two hours for each revolution, almost a full day in orbit around the moon. They fire that engine again back to the side of the moon, away from the control of the Earth. For 45 minutes of every two-hour revolution, uh, they are out of control from the Earth, uh, and they fire back to come on the long trip back to Earth and land in the Pacific on uh, next Friday morning. We have, we think for you, uh, a most interesting patching together using the space that man has pioneered from here at Cape Kennedy through uh, the communication satellites this morning. We have standing by two men on opposite sides of the Earth uh, with opposite viewpoints on the importance of this flight of Apollo 8, of man going to the moon at this time. Sir Bernard Lovell is at Jodrell Bank in England, where he presides over that great telescope, radio telescope, that pierces uh, farther into the heavens than any other. Uh, he's opposed to this flight. And Dr. William Pickering, a Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, uh, who faith. Imagine uh, uh, you're looking upon this flight with great excitement after all the Jet Propulsion Laboratory has done to explore the moon with the unmanned vehicles. Yes, indeed. I, I regard this flight as a very major significance and a very important flight. What, uh, what do you see the significance of this flight other than the spectacular nature of uh, man getting there? Well, this is the next step in, in the uh, series of steps which are going to lead to man eventually being on the moon and returning. And this uh, Apollo mission uh, today uh, is uh, obviously uh, the most difficult step we've attempted yet and uh, perhaps the most important. And uh, success in this uh, mission is very important indeed uh, for the future of the Apollo program. Dr. Pickering, I invite you to say good morning to Dr. Lovell. Good morning, Sir Bernard. I expect you're all excited uh, in America like we are here. Oh, we're very excited at this, uh, this flight, yes. Do you think, Dr. Pickering, that... Uh... I'm afraid, uh, Dr. Pickering, uh, that uh, we have lost the satellite. Oh. Uh, for the moment, uh, we've lost the satellite picture, and perhaps it sounded mm -hmm. as if we... Dr. Pickering, you know, we'll be coming back in the morning after we get successfully into orbit, and uh, uh, we'll look forward to talking to you then. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Pickering. Thank you. The count is T minus nine minutes now, and counting. Just nine minutes. Uh, in fact, uh, it's just eight minutes now until the uh, scheduled launch of the Apollo 8, and uh, we hear from Mission Control that everything is go for this flight. If I could very quickly show you the magnitude of this flight, I'd like to do that. If I could give a warning to, uh, to my uh, stalwart director, uh, Freddie Stolmack, down below here somewhere, I'd like to show you something. Over here on this globe of the moon, of the Earth, man, in the highest he's ever been off the surface of the Earth, uh, in the flight of Gemini 11, was 850 miles high. And by the scale of this globe, that would be three quarters of an inch three quarters of an inch off of that surface. You could use this little model just to kind of show you that. Just that, three quarters of an inch. Now, if this were all in scale, this flight would be taking man this far. And I'm sorry, Freddie, I'm going right out of your lighting and everything else here because it goes, it would go 30 feet instead of three quarters of an inch. 30 feet out into space to reach the moon. What a flight. What a thing this flight of Apollo 8 will be. And what a remarkable achievement for the space program when you consider that we really got started only seven years ago with the flight of the first Mercury on a Redstone rocket. And now if I can take just a second, I'll show you where we are here as we watch this flight. We are here uh, three miles from the launch pad, pad 39A, a moon port here at Merritt Island near Cape Kennedy, the Kennedy Spacecraft Center, Space Center. Over there, perhaps you can see, well, that body of water out there is incidentally is the barge canal that brings these great beasts here from uh, their manufacturing point in Louisiana, Michaud, Louisiana. They go into a huge building over here at the left in volume, the largest building in the world, as large as the Pentagon and the a Chicago merchandise mark put together. It's the vehicle assembly building, and uh, 
Uh, that's three miles as we are from the launch site, and it is where the launch control center is, where the launch is controlled until the liftoff has been completed uh, when uh, control shifts to the manned space center in Houston, Texas. We're looking out southeast, roughly, and that will be the direction of the flight as it takes off and uh, moves on up into space. Now, what you're going to see in these first few minutes, and it's T minus six and a half minutes and counting now, very shortly we're we'll going to go to mission control and listen to mission control's Jack King uh, reporting on the first stages of the flight and the countdown, too.